Welcome, book lovers, back to our book club this month. I'm your host, Marissa Serafini, joined alongside with Phil Svitek, of course. And this month, we are Uh-oh. doing Barbara King Silver's Prodigal Summer. Um, yeah, I mean, I've had actually never read her books, and but I heard a lot of good things about her. Um, she she was big in like '90s, early 2000s. Mostly, I think I heard about her like through Oprah <laughs> and just like the the older generation not to say like old old generation but you know just like the the people who are older than me would read um Barbara King Solver um and and I think I heard about her also through my mom so it's just like uh I I kind of knew about her tangentially through people and then um yeah so I decided we would do prodigal summer for the month of August still being technically summer and here we are reading this book so Phil let's hear your quick thoughts about this one yeah uh much like you it's not an author that I was too familiar with and yeah a lot of sort of acclaim so I knew that much going into it um did not know honestly what to expect it felt um just by the description of it you know it takes place over the course of one summer so it's like okay cool um you know, I can vibe with that. I like sort of semi-contained, you know, stories like that, that just, you know, involve one season and you anticipate, you know, people will start at position A and change to position C, D, E, maybe all the way to Z, who knows, right? And that's the fun of it all. And I really appreciate the nature aspect of it. Um, And overall, yeah, I mean, I think it's a book that I think, you have to have a lot of faith in because it doesn't necessarily move at a blazing pace. And, you know, all the stories, like there's three particular storylines. And at first you're like, okay, well, where, where are they going? But eventually Mm -hmm. they go some, I mean, like they, your, your faith and patience is rewarded ultimately. And so that's what I truly appreciate. Yeah, and I've said it in past conversations that I am a big fan of nonlinear storytelling and stories that have multiple characters who who are seemingly disparate from each other, but somehow they all connect in that way. This is one of those books where you have three characters. Eventually, they'll it'll make sense how they're all tied together within this county of Zebulon. Um, what was surprising to me because me just like not knowing the history of, of Barbara Kingsolver, the author, is that there was a lot of science involved in this book. There was a lot of biology that I wasn't expecting. Um, and there was a lot of economic values and um, and just ethics. So, like, it's one of those stories that made me question a lot of things. I was like, oh, wasn't expecting this. I thought it was just, like, a dramatic story of three different people and living their lives. But, like, it's really what they were going through every day and, like, the questions that it brought up um, that just, like still makes us reflect of like what's happening in the world and how we live in society and it's still actually kind of relevant so um i thought that was interesting and i wasn't expecting that yeah i mean certainly i think um you you know just in general there seems to be a slight disconnect between city folk and people of the countryside right and Mm -hmm. um you know my big thing to most people is at the end of the day we all need each other right and there's an interdependence and i think too oftentimes we get lost in the argument of who's more important who brings more value and i'm like both right (laughs) so i truly you know i I appreciate that aspect of it and highlighting yeah the the plight of sort of more subdued lifestyle in comparison to an urban environment yeah and then i mean and that can go into politics and just people's values and how we were raised compared to i mean i personally grew up in a very very small town agricultural town um i had a cornfield in my backyard so like i definitely like grew up in a small town surrounded by small town people with that small town mentality of like this is how they see the world and this is how they think of everything and but like once i moved to the city i saw the city life and i saw how people saw the world and how they thought and i mean it, it can bleed into politics too just like the whole democrats versus republicans libertarians versus conservatives and just like you can see just how different people think and it's 
how we treat each other based on our opinions and our values and but like how we also have to learn to coexist with each other too um and you know there are other political parties too and i don't want to get too too far into the politics but it's more like just the foundations of how we're raised compared to how like the, the situations and the environments that we grow up in or we move to we adapt to and um you definitely had those type of personalities involved in this book well i think i mean obviously you know we, we started off kind of bring our own perhaps separation from it but even mm-hmm. with the story itself right i mean one of the main storylines is about two neighbors who can't stand each other <laughs> right right they're literally neighbors and then of course um you have the widow uh, who um you know who comes from quote unquote a city it's not that big a city you know we're not talking about new york here but to them like that oh she's big city girl um and you know she marries into this family and she's viewed upon a certain way because of that right um and even just and then of course the third storyline is the ranger versus the hunter right mm-hmm. so just even with like there's an infinite way to divide them within their own subcultures right and so i think if anything that, that was a big takeaway for me was yeah, you can, you can get creative with it and figure out all the differences. But at the end of the day, we all need each other. Um, and again, where it starts off seemingly very separate, you know, in terms of the storylines, weaves together in this tapestry of like, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, these are all the people in, well, not all the people, but like these are the pe- generally the type of people in this small county of Zebulon on this mountain. Um, yeah, so you kind of brought it up. We do have the these three main storylines. Let's let's start with Deanna first. Um, she covers the Predators chapter. Then once you read um, her storylines with the Predators, she's a ranger on this mountain. She likes that isolated life away from people. Um, and she, she spends most of her days in solitude, but she seems more in tune with nature, more in tune with animals. She understands how they live and breathe and work and, and exist in that way. And like even the description of her writing and how she like views all these animals that like whether it be coyotes or the birds or like any type of wildlife, she just seems so in tune with them compared to being actually in t- more in tune with um, humans so well, what were your thoughts of Deanna and then this young hunter who basically challenges her and everything she thinks about animals um, this storyline of how Deanna was written yeah so you know the hunter Eddie Bondo he's always mm-hmm. coming to us full name Eddie Bondo Eddie Bondo but, uh, yeah I mean I, I, I felt for her right very early on we do learn that she's basically been at this for two years and as a byproduct of getting divorced um you know and and she realized like she kind of came into her own realizing that you know that life wasn't for me the husband wasn't for me and so forth so she likes her isolation and she kind of sees more of the balance of life itself um hence why i mean she's overall very protective of the coyotes because she sees their need for them rather than generally whether the hunter or us just as humans you know we look at all kinds of animals not just i mean we look at bugs and anything like that right the fact that we have a thing called pest control as if we can control nature right Right. um and so she sees the interconnectivity to it and yeah i mean it's very much like this whole book is yin and yang and trying to figure out the balance for humanity right um and even deanna she's trying to figure out her own animal instincts like on the one hand she hates eddie bondo on the other hand she just wants to rip his clothes off every chance she gets yeah (laughs) um again with that the primal nature of just being human because yeah we see that she she seems way more comfortable on her own but then like once a man enters her life it's like no i do want this too um, and I don't know if that just goes to like us, just that animalistic raw nature that we have as as mammals that like we kind of need that carnal need for each other. Um, and we see that. So like we understand that. Yeah, she's still a woman. She still has her needs. Um, but also this this man, Eddie Bondo, just with the complete type of polar opposite mentality that she has, like she she preserves wildlife. She she 
reveres animals more than she reveres human. And then we have Eddie who just like, let's kill all these coyotes and like whatever your opinion is. Um, so like we have like for every story, really, um, we have like diametrically opposing characters. And I think that was like an interesting setup because it at the end, everybody has to like really learn how to coexist with each other, even though they don't think alike and they have and they're basically opposite. Like how they're 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 opposite not in like the antagonistic way, but more in the devil's advocate way that makes you challenge um values and opinions and makes you kind of look at it from a different perspective. So what were your th- thoughts on the the opposing forces in all these stories? Well, spe- yeah, specifically to Dina, I mean, um, what's intriguing to me is um, how much, you know, the, the time with um, Nanny, right? And the fact that, like, she does get pregnant, doesn't end up telling um, Eddie and mm-hmm. kind of, you know, makes her own choice about how she's going to live and move forward in this world, right? So, in a sense... Um, she she accepts eddie but that was just a phase of her life if you will you know um versus like another constant thing you know so if anything i think she's learned to understand that there's an impermanence to life life you know and so she's moving forward in the way that she would rather be in control of let's say yeah did um did the age difference ever bother you? Because, I mean, we see that a lot in whether it comes to television, it comes to movies, um, especially when it comes to opposite sex, when there's a major um, age difference and that like that could be a big factor in why relationships don't work. But it is also just like how we exist because different generations, different mentalities. Um, what were your thoughts of the age difference? Did that bother you? Um, I mean, generally, it's the man who's older and the woman who's younger. This time, it was right. first. Uh, so it bothered me less because of that. Um, and certainly, it's a, it's a primary concern for Deanna throughout the whole thing and whatnot. So I think, and I, I think that's also ultimately why, you know, as far as the, her identifying differences between them, you know, she realizes she's in a different stage of life. And that she's going to act accordingly to, um, you know, her season, pun intended, right? Because it's mm-hmm. we're all we're all in these different phases of our lives, and so she's approaching. I'm I'm not saying she's in in the fall of her life, but you know, she's her summer's more coming to an end, whereas he might be more peak summer, let's say. Right. So. Um, right. Heck, he might even be spring breaking. You know, at the beginning of summer. Maybe um, I, I yeah. just break for me as like kids, but yeah, right. Um, I yeah, I, I I totally agree with that. With the whole that she's more mature, she's seen life more, she's more experienced, and uh, she has this. She's been through a marriage. She's been out of a marriage. She has like just more life experience of like how she knows how people live how people think, how animals think. Um, I mean, she, she's been single. She's been together with someone. So like, she, she, she kind of, she just knows more, more than Eddie Bondo just in life. And I think that was interesting to, when you have like a younger person, like stir up everything. You're like, Oh no, how's this going to go? <laughs> um, but I, I did like the fact that Eddie, you know, challenged her in that way. The, the, like, yeah, you think coyotes are great for, population and all that um but also do we really need them um so again with just uh you you think i i thought he honestly we was gonna like stick around a little longer but ultimately he didn't and but she made that choice it's like no i'm gonna take care of this baby on my own um and that was her prerogative i mean he did you know i i mean i i'm torn of like well was it respectful because he did read her thesis and so mm-hmm. if anything else he kind of came to his own opinion right um but at least did so in a seemingly respectful way right like it, right. it, it didn't just like he could have easily said i'm not reading this or you know just 
outright shunned it, but he didn't necessarily do that. And so if anything, um, there was a, there was a respect, you know, even though it didn't work out, at least it's like, okay, it's, it's on relative good terms, let's say. Yes, exactly. And talking about how they're tied together, um, we we do find out that Deanna knows Nanny Raleigh, who is the basically the diametric opposing force to um, our second story, Garnet. Um, Garnet Walker, he's an old crotchety man, <laughs> um, and he wants to basically bring back the American chestnut tree lineage and him and his neighbor nanny they they just go back and forth between oh i want to use pesticides and insecticides and no i don't because that kills everything um so what did you think of these two it, again different generation they're older um still man and and, and woman but what did you think of this storyline and how they reflected each other yeah i mean we we primarily get everything through his perspective um so you know not saying there's a bias towards him, but but in general, you you kind of empathize more with him just because you you know his plight, right? A little mm-hmm. bit you do hers, but it is interesting um, seeing those pitfalls um, very early on, right? There's that whole uh, chapter where he's essentially planning out his errands, wants to go do it, and then you know is trying to avoid her, but then sees her at the convenience store. And he thinks that she's making fun of him be- because he's so angry only to like drive home, not do anything and realize, oh, wait, that had nothing to do with me. Right. <laughs> right. So it's um, it's just it, it's, it's, it's a very interesting illustration of just how debilitating our own minds can be once we just have this hatred for somebody else. Um, and again, it's their neighbors and what one does affects the other but certainly you know where the synergy is i don't know because they're all, like what one does to the other it's like in theory it should work where yes what she does on her own property is her own business and what he does on his own property is his business mm-hmm. you know um nature you don't you can't just draw a boundary in nature and like have bees not fly over or you know whatever chemicals and blah 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 right and so right. they realize the problem and you know i don't know ultimately where i end up with either of them um but at least like they find peace right <laughs> i think that's yeah the- i mean they, they get to they get to a point of finally co-existing and respecting each other um and and you, you go back to like they're, they're affecting each other's lives without actually fully communicating. And then I think that's the problem. It's like so many problems in life can be resolved if we actually just sat down, face each other and talked as uncomfortable as conversations may be. It's like, no, we can actually get a lot done if we just resolve this and talk to each other like grown adults. But the thing is, is that both of these both of them are grown adults and they're avoiding each other, not talking to each other. She's moving his do not spray signs so they're um he can't um like build his trees because you know they're 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 not getting the proper chemicals that they're supposed to and then um his trees are affecting her her bugs and all that and just like again they're they're avoiding each other (laughs) but once and like it could just be the older generation they finally do start talking via letters um, so what were your thoughts of these letters back and forth with each other? He has that scientific creation life mentality, and she has this religious side uh, between God, Adam, and Eve. It's like, this is how the world is supposed to be, or how is it was created. So not to get too much into the science versus religion, but what did you think of those, that opposing force? Um, well, I think they part of it, they realized that maybe they aren't. Uh, opposing forces right maybe like mm-hmm. maybe there's a similarity you know and, and there's there's a connection there and yeah i think as far as the letters you know me i'm a, I'm a fan of letters so yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah sometimes you need to change up the medium like if, if certainly them talking is not i mean there there was the opportunity when the snapping turtle got to him and he thought he was having a heart attack mm-hmm. 
but of course his own ego was so heavily bruised that like that shut down any notion uh because he was thankful when he thought he would it was a heart attack that she did help him and then once he found out it was a snapping turtle he was like f this i'm out of here right so yeah and i i think you know what obviously what letters allow you to do is a moment of reflection like you know if something upsets you in the moment well you can kind of think about it like was this really how it's stated or am i reading that in my mind um and allows cooler heads to prevail theoretically right obviously it could have gone a different way but in this case it allowed for an opening of a door you know yeah um, I allowed them that that door to finally talk to each other, finally just like understand where each other's coming from, um, because he's he's so adamant on um, reviving this extinct American chestnut lineage, and um, but she seems more with the kind of with the times of just like economics and how people are agriculture, you know, like how the world is working um, when it comes to just, you know, pesticides and what the chemicals actually doing for science now. Um, but, it, and I think it's just interesting that it's like, he's kind of living a little bit in the past and trying to bring it back and like still kind of keep history present while she's in the present and be like, well, no, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to do what we're supposed to be doing now. Um, so I, I think that, I thought that was interesting, but I, I like the fact that because they are older, they got to a level of is seemingly respect towards each other at the end. Like, OK, if if you do this and I do this, we can like still coexist. <laughs> um, and then we, we see how Garnett is actually tied to our third story, Lusa and her um, her storyline. So Lusa, a young recent widow she, city life um so we we get the again the younger generation now and uh she, her diametric opposing force is basically her ex's family who basically just wants to take over this farm uh take on the responsibility to be like no girl l- let us do it let us handle this land that should have been rightfully ours in the first place let us take care of it and you just go back to the city so what were your thoughts of you know basically Lusa against her ex's family. Yeah, I mean, it's tough because on the on the one hand, she has every right to essentially do what she wants to do. Um, the only problem is she she doesn't know that how the seasons work here, right? So she, her, mm-hmm. her lack of knowledge is very debilitating. And, you know, what, it, it, I thought it was very interesting because so Cole, her husband, right? towards um you know but like they've only been married uh pretty much a year and in that time they managed to basically not really speak to each other you know and so there was this huge disconnect and through sort of her journey of trying to figure out what to do with the farm let's say she learned that you know what cole was actually no different he was an idealist in a lot of ways just like her but the reality of the situation kind of beat him down and that's what kind of got him to, and, and that's very understandable, right? And something obviously she didn't know, but I like, I, I you know, as far as the full storyline, I appreciate that essentially she kept that dream alive and found an option that seemed so impossible for everyone else and yet so obvious and doable. Right, I mean, at the beginning of the storyline so she she covers the moth love chapters um she is an entomologist so she studied bugs and creatures little creatures in, in that life um and like yeah at the beginning of the story you think like how are these two even married <laughs> you know like or do they even line up with each other but then like we do find out that there are a lot of similarities especially their um opinions about whether they should use the farm or that land for growing tobacco, which like economically that would have been made more money. Like if that would have been more lucrative type of business, especially with the times that it is again, uh, like what's better for the economy. Do you want money or do you just want again with the ethics and politics of just the world? Like what, what, Lusa wanted for the farm compared to what uh, Cole's family wanted for the farm. 
And I think that that was like the whole um, conflict, I guess. It was just like who and what they get to do and decide to do with that farm. Um, but that's where we learned that Lusa and Cole wanted the same things. Like they didn't want all that land to grow uh, tobacco and stuff. They they wanted it for more healthier um, agriculture, other prosperous things um, besides uh, um, be- besides tobacco. Like let let's not like conform to just so we can get money. Um, and I thought that was interesting. I, I liked that because. Lusa, I was like really worried. Uh, I was really worried that Cole's sisters were just going to take over and be like, nah, girl, this is ours. Go away. Um, but like Lucy stood her ground. So good on her. Well, and and I appreciate like um, she really formed that bond with Jewel, um, which is one of the sisters who is in a relative situation where, you know, she didn't lose her husband to death, but she lost her husband because she got up and left. Mm. Uh you know, unlike Lusa, Jules got kids and things like that. Um, but there's, yeah, the 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 kinship between them. And, and at a certain point early on, you know, you could start to wonder, and she sort of did too, of like, am I being manipulated? Like, is this um, part of a tactic? But right. you know, as time goes by, I think they recognize that there was a genuineness there, you know, and they could confide in each other. And... You know, certainly the the Widener family, like uh, the reason why she even has this farm to begin with is because her husband was the only man, right? And so as the man, he gets everything. Uh, the sisters, land. you know, just barely an acre each, right? Or whatever it is. Yeah. And and of course, even in their own lives, um, you know, it's it's the husbands that are kind of making making the shots and so forth. And on the one hand, like, um, I do appreciate the fact that, like, they are there for each other, right? I, I mean, I know it comes off as negative because it's different from what Lusa wants. But the fact that, like, they're there um, as if, like, business as usual, as if, you know, nothing had happened to Cole to ready to, like, okay, we've got to do this, we've got to do that. Um, you know, I think just that mentality readjusted is a beautiful mm-hmm. thing, you know? So. Yeah, I, I'm so glad because like at the beginning, I was again, I was worried for her because these women just come in and like try to steamroll her, try to intimidate her like, no, girl, you don't know what you're signing up for. You're biting off more than you can chew. Let us handle it. You're like, we're going to relieve you of this. But I got to give it to Lucy. She's like, you know what? No, and she's like she's very aware that like, hey, I'm out of my element here. But if you just back off a little bit, give me some space and give me some time, I can figure out what to do with this. So like this is my responsibility but like let give me the time to like figure out all the steps that i need to do and um and i like that and i think from the you know you can see a lot of stories like women against women like women can get catty uh like that that's just how our gender is but so i was worried about that and like that that's like a big turn off for me but when we eventually see these girls the the sisters try to like really get to know lusa um, know how she was like r- what she saw in Cole and like are like oh no no Luce is a good person she she has good intentions she's um and she really wants to try and they got to again a level of understanding and respect so at the end with coexistence <laughs> we're like all right Lusa do your thing yeah. and I like that I I enjoyed that a bit um and again with the bringing up the ethics and economics is just like these women being trying to be like business women within the economy, like what's going to make us the most money. And Lisa's like, no, it was never about that. Um, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. But there is that harsh reality that you have to find a way to survive. And, you know, uh, there's a big difference, right? Like even like as it was presented, right. The tobacco, the tobacco was barely getting them through and that was the most they could make right versus like if you try anything else you're making in fact you're probably losing money right like that that's mm-hmm. basically what it was you know and so it's just a harsh reality uh, of it all and yeah it, you know it does from a larger perspective it does make you reflect because you know farms and things like that are 
in trouble. And so then we turn to corporate forming, which of course is terrible. Um, and so it's like, you know, we, we, we really don't reward, <laughs> you know what I mean? The, the hierarchy of what we think is important versus what actually is important is right. There's like, this. Don't sell out just to survive on the farm. Um, and, and I like Lusa. She, she, kind of thought outside the box because I mean everyone was so used to cows and she's like well let's try goats you know that goats bring goat milk and and all, all these other different properties that you probably weren't thinking of they can be another um, lucrative thing that can make this farm successful and no one thought about goats and then when and and then the sisters were you know challenging her it was like oh did you bring like did you buy a bunch of goats just to spite us and we're like no 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 this is this is just a new avenue for us to try to make revenue and i like lisa because she brought a different perspective um she thought outside the box creatively even though she wasn't in line with the sisters but she was generally thinking of ideas to keep that farm alive and uh good on her <laughs> again i really like lisa um for for being the the person who thought of a lot of different ways you know the creative he, she was like more creative in her business thinking yeah and i, th I think you know each of these storylines as we've sort of touched upon has that push and pull of past and present right where you, you can make the argument each one of them is trying to respect the past and kind of maintain it but in the harsh realities of the current world and mm -hmm. that's the problem it's like you know, the answer is not always simple. Um, and so, but, you know, we all sort of need each other. And I, th I think that's what, to me, the novel just highlights that aspect, that interconnectivity, and that the best solutions really come about when we all at least like speak to each other, right? I mean, hell, I don't agree with myself 100% of the time, right? So how do you expect to agree yeah. with someone else? But as long as you can have that mutual understanding of, okay, then I think you can push forward and get to solutions, right? And I think by the mm -hmm. end, you know, th there's this, uh, Loretta Ross talks about this concept of pulling in, right? So, you know, is it going to be peace on earth with all of them? No, not necessarily. But they recognize that like, oh, we're not necessarily enemies. We have whatever, 50% in common. So let's just right. leave 50%. Versus highlighting the stuff we hate about each other. Yeah. And again, I like how you brought up, you know, the, the trying to keep the history alive within the present day. And um, it, it's like, yeah, we want to be respectful of what we what we did in the past, but also we got to get with the times, too. And that's where they're trying to just navigate, like, what can we do now that still is respectful of the history but won't you know tank us <laughs> um in, in present day like do we sell out to corporate do we just you know go about how we're doing it and but maybe not be fruitful in a year or it's just like the the just fighting economics of just the common everyday um and i think that was interesting too because that's what that's what we fight and that's what a uh, fight about just even today in society it's like how uh, you know economics and you know you can see with housing markets you can see with just you know businesses like uh when pe new people take over um takeovers and stuff is like how do we keep the old but this is like the new day you know so like those principles are still the same we still see that and um and then i think that's what everybody in this book is and then i think that's why this book kind of ages pretty well actually because those principles are still here those are the universal themes that we're still fighting every day yeah and um, even though it takes enjoy that. the course of one summer it highlights a richness of i mean one could argue eternity right uh so because <laughs> that aspect um you know i mean each of them that that past and present thing is in the present they're trying to essentially survive right like i mean just the realities of the economy whereas they also know by doing so it's at what cost to let's say their soul the longevity of them their family you know zeblum county like all of it right like they know the well aware of the harms that any of this any of their actions could have but again it's like 
what's the alternative? And unfortunately, yeah, that's that's the sort of perhaps at times gross reality of the world we live in. Yeah. Yeah. And then ultimately we find out that Lusa is like she kind of married into this family who's connected to Garnett. <laughs> um, like what what was it? Correct me if I'm wrong. It was like great great grandfather or like the um I I could be getting that wrong. Uh but she uh Lu- Lucy and Garnett are also tied together, um, connected. So again, we, we just see at the end of how everyone is in essentially connected to each other um within the small Zebulon Mountain County. Uh you know, and the, that's very small town life. <laughs> it really is, because like it, you go down a mile of like, oh, yeah, I know who you are. Or like you're married to this person who was friends with this person. You know, that's that's a very small town thing. Um, and, and also you can joke like it's a small world. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we and so ultimately they all tie together. Uh, is there anything else about this book that uh, we might have missed or something that you wanted to bring up? Uh, I mean, I'm sure there's there's plenty that. You know, we could go any which way. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I really like the Zeblum County aspect of it. Um, and yeah, I mean, as far as like the tie-ins to um, Barbara, you know, she she had two properties and she split her time, um, you know, between there and um, elsewhere. This was her fifth book. And yeah, really, really good job um, overall, you know. And like I said, I mean, it's, it's not the fastest read. Um, mm-hmm. I also remember, yeah. I remember the first two chapters being sort of longer, and then I got to Garnett's, and it was like two pages. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. So the, that- the pacing does go in and out. I, I do um, agree with that, but also like with, with the writing, um, I haven't read any of her her stories, so I didn't realize there was going to be like so much science and so much biology involved. And you brought it up a little bit, but like her background, Barbara Kingsolver, um, she she was born in Maryland uh, and she lived in Kentucky, so she kind of had that southern life. Um, but then she went over to to Europe a bit, and then she did a lot of journalism over there. Um, but she actually in the seventies she got a degree um in biology. And then uh, later on, when she got her, when she was a grad student in Arizona, Tucson, um, she she, uh, she she worked in the, the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. So again, with the just how chemicals evolve with biology, how it affects nature, how it affects animals, how it affects economy. Um, so we we saw a lot of that bleed into <laughs> into this book. And then um, she married a chemist. So again, with more science and uh, but she would go a lot of she would go back and forth a lot because she had kids and she had different writing opportunities. But like sometimes she was in one area learning like in the in the southern area, the Appalachians. She learned like how the society worked there, working over in um, Europe and then, you know, just going back and forth. So she got a lot of like different again opposing um uh ideals and you you saw that again in this book like different parallels in in that way and uh and she's also responsible for the bellwether prize which i didn't even know about that she's the one who actually helped um bring the bellwether prize that this is an annual uh scholarship kind of award that's that's usually given to a first-time novelist um, I've heard about it, but I didn't realize she was at the forefront of it. So good for her. Um, and uh, she, she's had a lot of books since the Poison of Bible was actually the a big book that like kind of got her into the, the mainstream because that was a choice from Oprah's book club. And I think that's how I heard of it. And um, I haven't read that one, but then I saw Prodigal Summer was also uh, a part of her repertoire. I was like, well, let's read this one. <laughs> uh, so. She, she brings a lot of science and economics to her stories. So um, there, there, there's some history about Barbara and her writing style, which I was not uh, not aware of. Yeah. And it's, you know, none of it's like the science stuff is never didactic, right? It's all part of the characters. It, it, it deepens our understanding of them. And, 
you know, I think um, life in itself is messy enough. And in that respect, there's no real antagonist, right? Um, the, the antagonist is just life, but it's just because it is, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I always appreciate that, right? Because I could also see a version of this book done by somebody else where, you know, here's the three main storylines. Here's our, like, quote, unquote, protagonists. And then, yeah, you know, with Lusa, the family is evil. With Garnett, you know, the neighbor is the spawn of Satan. Um, <laughs> you know, Deanna, Eddie Bondo turns out to be a, you know, sh- shithead, right? Like, they're in her, with her writing qualities, all of it really is on an elevated level that just transcends and yeah i mean as we talked about even just with garnett and and nanny um you understand both right and therefore as a as a reader you're you are sort of conflicted of like well whose side am i on right like (laughs) who am i supposed to like and i think that's what i like because i i naturally respected everybody and i didn't see uh, I was more worried about the sisters. I was like, oh, no, what are they going to do? But then when you hear everybody's storyline and where they're coming from, it, again, it's just like if we all just sat down and communicated to each other and understood where we come from, we can understand how to coexist with each other even better. And uh, and like and that's the problem that we see in the world, that people just don't want to take the time to understand each other. Um, but if we do, if we'd, be, we'd live in a much better, nicer world towards each other we wouldn't think just because you think one way doesn't mean another person's opinion is wrong or you're or you're right it's just like that's how they think that's how we live um it's the importance of communication if anything i took away from this book is like if we just talk to each other we can exist so much better my thing is like we just need the time to do that right like it's you know I, i always look at it this way most of us are just struggling to just get through our day, you know? So like the idea that we can take on anything else, unfortunately is overwhelming because the basics are already overwhelming in a lot of ways. So yeah, yeah, it, it can be, it can be a lot. And certainly that's reflected in each of the characters in, in a lot of ways, you know? I mean, I, I one particular thing that stands out is when Deanna, right? Like she enjoyed herself but then she also was like, I'm behind on my work. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a there's a cost to all of it. A cost of pleasure, a cost of, you know, we still got to get work done at the end of the day. We still got to survive. Um, overall, I did actually enjoy this book. We had a lot of different type of characters and their personalities, but I did take away a lot from this. I was like, yeah, and maybe it's, me growing up in small town, I understand how people think <laughs> and that type of mentality. But also now that I live in the city, I also know how they think. So I don't know. It, it resonated a lot with me because I and I understand both sides. Um, maybe a lot of people don't, but I get where everyone came from. Um, so with that, Phil, do you have any fun books that you've been reading on the side, reading for fun, pleasure um, that you want to bring up and make people aware of? Uh, not as many. This this month's been kind of hectic, but uh, I'm trying to get into yeah. Hey Dick Scanner Darkly. Um, you know, okay. I enjoy the movie by Richard Linklater. Um, you know, Philip K. Dick, obviously a, a wonderful sci-fi writer, well regarded, and um, I've heard that like Scanner Darkly is it's a very deeply personal book to to Philip K. Dick. You know, he lost a lot of friends to drugs and things like that. So that's one of the themes, certainly, in that book. So I'm excited to dive into it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have seen the movie. It's been a while since I've seen it, but maybe I should revisit it thanks to um, you bringing that up. Uh, yeah, I, I read Flowers for Algernon um, by Daniel Keyes. That, that was a big story in, I believe, the 60s, 70s. Um, and that's, you know, about a, a young man who, uh, his intelligence level is really low. And then there's a scientific experiment and his IQ gets smarter and smarter every day. Um, and he makes friends with this mouse who they're doing the same 
scientific experiments to the mouse, but you, you see how it's affecting his intelligence level and how people think of him compared to how he was when he had a lower intelligence compared to where he had a higher intelligence. But unfortunately, in the story, his intelligence also decreases, like it increases exponentially and then eventually goes back down. And but his EQ, his emotional uh, quotient is like still pretty high and you just you just feel for him because you know even though he's aware more aware of everything now he's also more emotionally aware and uh, I don't know he's just like I, I empathized a lot with this so that was a really good read classic I understand why people uh, enjoy that one um, currently just started again I'm big on book talks so <laughs> I'm reading the fourth wing um, what can I say I'm a woman I like sci-fi. I like fantasy. Uh, you know, if, if you're if you liked the um, the Dragon Republic War books that you know we talked about, it's kind of like the same demographic. You know, you have dragons, you have military teenagers fighting against each other. Um, so I just started that. I haven't finished it, but yeah, I've been reading that for fun as well. And uh, upcoming books that we have for our upcoming months, Phil, we have Hocus Pocus. The sequel, you see, your choice. Who technically wrote it? Because like it's just a Disney freeform book. Um, I'm for it. Like Amazon Hocus Pocus and the all new sequel. That's how you can find it. Um, and yeah, I mean it's essentially two books. The first one is literally a novelization of Hocus Pocus, but um, it's a lot of fun because it 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 is a little bit additive, and I I, I appreciate that. Um, it's literally pretty much like scene by scene, the whole thing with just a little bit of you, you get into the mindset, which is fun of the characters. And then um, you get part two, which is not like the actual Disney Plus sequel of Hocus Pocus 2. It is actually I mean, this came out before Hocus Pocus 2. And I thought mm -hmm. Hocus Pocus 2 was going to be more like this. Um, in fact, I'll read it. 25 years later, Max and Allison's 17-year-old daughter, Poppy, finds herself face-to-face -face with the Sanderson sisters in all their sinister glory. When Halloween celebrations don't quite go as planned, it's a race against time as Poppy and her friends fight to save her family and all of Salem from the witches' latest vile scheme. So. Yeah. Exciting. Yeah. Uh, again, bringing in a new generation. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to read that. I have it. And then uh, for the the following month, we have Stranger With My Face by Lois Duncan. This was my choice for the month of October. It's a thriller, psychological thriller, kind of horror. I, I figured that that'd be good for the month of October, being Halloween month. And yes, Lois Duncan, she is most notably known for I Know What You Did Last Summer. So she's the same author. Um, so it's going to be in that kind of scary realm. I don't know why I signed myself up for that, but I think it's going to be fun for us. <laughs> and then we have your choices, Phil. Yeah, so uh, we're kind of doubling up on my choices because we realized if we continue at the pace, then we each get the same holidays. So yeah. um, November is actually supposed to be my month, so I picked The Legend of Bagger Vance, a very famous movie with um, Will Smith, uh, Charlize Theron, um, and so forth. Um, and this is what kind of put Stephen Pressfield, who is the author of War of Art, uh, on the map. I've known Stephen Pressfield as a nonfiction writer, but, you know, I was like, time to read, time to read his fiction. So, yeah. and then right in time for Christmas, we're going to skip Christmas. Actually, no, <laughs> it's, uh, John Grisham skipping Christmas um, felt very apropos. Um, I've wanted to read John Grisham. I've never read him. This is a very short book. Um, and you know what? What's Christmas without murder and mystery and mayhem? Yeah, I think we should keep along the lines of like our Christmas should be like murder mysteries because we did. Hercules Perot's Christmas um, with Agatha Christie's. So, like, I, I like this theme, the mystery for Christmas. Maybe we should find more more books for that, <laughs> but we'll see. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm excited to read all those. I still haven't read any any of the upcoming books. So fun things down the line for us. Phil, where can everyone follow you? Follow your stuff and all your books. Uh, very easy, just at Bill Svitek on pretty much every social media, regardless of whatever name changes they may have <laughs> during the future. Right. 
And you can follow me at Serafini TV on all the social media platforms. Um, you can follow my podcast, Friends and Favorites, where I talk to all my friends about their favorite books and movies and all that stuff too, which you will also see Phil. Um, so we, we have a lot of stuff and good content out there and more things to come. Thank you everyone for reading and talking along with us. So excited for the future books that we have. Keep reading, keep commenting, keep watching and keep enjoying life. Thanks everyone. We'll see you for our next book. Bye.